Welcome back to our last event of World Read Aloud Day Book Fest, day two. I'm Ava Vitale. And I'm Constance Gibbs. Ava, I can't believe how fast the time is going. I'm having a great time at World Read Aloud Day Book Fest. Right? And what a way to close out day two. Coming up next, we'll hear from this year's World Read Aloud Day author ambassador, Tammy Charles, educational expert, Dr. Jacqueline Sanderlin, and the founder of World Read Aloud Day herself, Pam Allen all together in a panel moderated by Dwayne Millard as they discuss ways reading can help foster community, foster community in different ways to be a reading role model reading and engage models, students and outside, engage of the class, outside of the class. As if that's not exciting enough, keep a look out in the chat for a chance to win a copy of this year's World Read Aloud Day lead title, All Because You Matter, written by panelist Tammy Charles. Let's give a virtual drum roll for how to incorporate literacy anytime, anywhere. Welcome everyone. We're excited to kick off Black History Month with our expert panel. They're gonna be discussing and focusing on the theme, how to incorporate literacy anytime, anywhere. Again, anytime, anywhere. Part of World Read Aloud Day Book Fest. We have an excellent lineup, including tips for how to build community and literacy together. Baby, it's Follow okay. Scholastic on that's Twitter my, and Instagram to see all of our World Read Aloud Day celebrations. Let me start off by introducing myself. My name is Dwayne Millard. I am the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Literacy Initiatives, which is a department that's part of Scholastic. For over 15 years, I've worked with school leaders, community organizations, corporations, and, and corporations to create strategic solutions that increase equity and access to books and resources for our children which I think is at the forefront of many people's minds as we approach this year's Re World Read Aloud Day. So let's talk a little bit about World Read Aloud Day so you know exactly what it is. World Read Aloud Day is a global holiday, now celebrated annually the first week of February in over 173 countries. It started in 2010 as a celebration of the power of read alouds, reading aloud, but particularly, particularly the, the idea of how it can be used as a tool to create community and to amplify voices. Check out, if you could take a moment and join me today as, we, as I introduce our, our panelists. But before I go there, I just wanted to say, check out, uh, check out World Read Aloud Day and check out our virtual kits. And you can see how to access the vir virtual kits on the screen. If you look at the screen to your right. Now I wanna introduce our panelists. Pam Allen is a renowned author. Hello, Pam. Wave to everyone, please. Hi, everybody. She is an educator and advocate for the lives of children as readers, writers, and learners. And the founder, the founder of the Global Literacy Initiative Lit World and World Read Aloud Day. She is a leading authority on the confluence of literacy and social emotional learning to transform academic and wellness outcomes in children and young adults of all ages. Again, welcome, Pam. Glad to see you. Secondly, an accomplished educator, leadership guru, and author, Dr. Jacqueline Sanderlin, is an expert in developing meaningful community partnerships and is the founder and CEO of the Why Not Incubator. I like to call it the Why Not Movement. This nonprofit organization is, is designed to provide leadership coaching about, about community, unity, wellness, equity, and racial healing. Her book, The Why Not Challenge, Say Yes to Success with School Community Partnerships, shares her passion and practical takeaways for forming lasting community relationships between schools, organizations, and companies. She has served students in the most challenging school districts in Southern California as a special education teacher, curriculum specialist, principal, central office, senior director as well. Currently, she is the K-12 National Education Leadership Executive Manager for Apple Incorporated and Senior Executive Consultant for Scholastic. And last but far from least, Tammy Charles. Tammy, if you could wave to everyone. Hello, Tammy. <laughs> Tammy is the author of numerous books for children ranging from the picture books to middle school, middle school grade and young adults, including the middle grade debut. Like Vanessa and the latest young adult novel in verse, which is Muted, she is also the author of the New York Times bestselling All Because You Matter, 
which earned three starred reviews and was named to the number one Amazon Best Children's Book of 2020, a Kirkus Reviews Best Book of 2020, and the Barnes and Noble's Best Book of 2020. Tammy is this year's World Read Aloud Day author ambassador. And All Because You Matter is the lead title on Scholastic's World Read, World Read Aloud Day top 30 picks. We also will be giving away a copy of All Because You Matter to three lucky participants. For a chance to win, leave your questions for the panel in the comments section. Please help me give a warm welcome to our panelists. I can hear the I can hear the hand. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah. This so is bad. how we talk in virtual spaces. We all learn to have <laughs> conversations. So I am going to ask you all some questions. And I'm going to start with you, Pam. As the founder of World Read Loud Day, I'm sure you've seen it grow and develop over the past 13 years. However, I can imagine that the past few years in particular has really challenged the way people are thinking about the importance of children's literacy. <clears throat> is reading and storytelling still playing a large role in building and holding together communities despite the upheaval of social distance, distancing and lockdowns? Can you tell me a bit about how you sh how you've shared read alouds, helping to foster meaningful connections? in spite of the ongoing daily disruptions caused by the pandemic. Well, thank you, Duane, and thank you everybody so much for all your support of World Read Aloud Day. It's so powerful and so inspirational to see everybody celebrating. And I just wanna say in, in response to your question, Duane, that I really felt in all of these last two years, you can see and you can feel the reverberation of the importance of the read aloud of all of literacy in a time when people have been so separated, children, their teachers, administrators, families really rallied together. I think in the last two years and thinking about what happened with World Read Aloud Day in that first year of COVID, when people felt so separated from one another, people came up with all kinds of amazing ideas to celebrate the read aloud, to on Facebook, principals, superintendents, teachers, sharing with their students by of any virtual means necessary to bring each other closer together and to feel the power of the human heart in such hard, hard times. Never before, I don't think really in, in, in the history of humanity, have we seen the power of literacy so, so deeply and so profoundly that we can say, even when we're separated, even when we're apart, even when we're alone, that literacy can bring us together, that it only it connects us, it connects us so deeply to one another. And we have seen that. So to me, these last two years of separation have only shown us even more how literacy, the power of story, and literacy, the power of the read aloud, and literacy, the fact that even when alone, you can be kept company by a book, shows us all the more how urgently important literacy is for every child, not just about skills, but about the human heart. And I wanna applaud you for always being an advocate through this whole process that we've gone through. And as you were saying in your statement, you can hear that even though we've gone through a challenging time, there have been a lot of innovations and a lot actually of opportunities for us to read aloud more. So thank you for that, Pam. Welcome Dr. Sanderlin, I'd love, to I'd love you to follow up and yeah. hear your thoughts as well. One of the main calls to action in your book, The Why Not Challenge, is for readers to mobilize both families and their communities towards engagement in schools. Mm -hmm. Right now, a lot of educators are feeling frustrated, burnt out, and overwhelmed for understandable reasons. And as a former educator myself, I can only imagine what it must feel like to be in a classroom right now. So pause, hats off to all the teachers and all the educators that are listening mm -hmm. right Yes. Despite all of that, what are the practical hands-on suggestions you have for those looking to build sustainable and long-term community partnerships? Where should they start? Hmm. That's a great question. And I think I will just kind of connect to what was just said with Pam. During these unprecedented times, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of things called learning loss. But I also think there has been such learning gained. And some of the learning gained is we learned that um, this is the time to reconnect. 
This is the time for families. This is the time for friends, even coming together in spaces like we are in a virtual space. We're engaging now in a connection, even if that connection, and one of the best connections, by the way, is to a great book, um, because it can virtually take you out of the space that we have been in, most of us isolated, but books took us to other places and they've always done that. And so one of the things that I will say, by the way, I love the why not movement, um, by the way, <laughs> I love that um, because I believe it is a movement. It's a movement of a mindset. That's the first thing that we should do as educators um, and thinking about partnerships is having a mindset that we are a partner and also having the mindset that there are other partners who really would like to work with us as stakeholders to make a difference in the lives of youth, whether that is bringing more books, bringing literacy books to homes. I mean, I have seen some wonderful um, opportunities where, and I call them opportunities because when you can have local businesses take their lunch break and take books and drop them off um, safely on a um, uh, at each home's in front of doorsteps, on doorsteps, waiting for children to, to receive them. That is really what is um, a true community um, empowerment. And I, I, I say empowerment, not engagement, because we really need to shift to that. Another, a couple, I want to share two other strategies that a district could do right now that can really help to spread that why not movement. One is to have that mindset and know that there are others around. They don't have to be educators. They could be businesses, corporations, individuals who would like to help um, bring connection and community with you and for your children. Secondly, another thing one can do is call. Mm -hmm. Be surprised who will pick up the phone. So call some of these local businesses, bring them to task and say, can you work with us to help bring literacy and learning and opportunities and access for our youth. And then thirdly, be welcoming to those who are willing to work with you. You'd be surprised how many of our schools sometimes have gotten so used to working alone that they don't know how to open their doors to others who don't look like them, who are not educators, but we're all educators in some sense. When we have a bigger mindset around what community is, we realize it's not just in the classroom. It's just not in the school. It is not just in the home. It is everywhere. Yes. And that is exactly where the why not movement is going. Why not reach out? Why not call? Why not allow people to come in so we can certainly create pathways and innovative ways for students to learn? So those are just a few. Um, and I'm excited, of course, you can tell that this is a movement. And the reason why I'm excited too, finally, is we're seeing this. If you're looking around, you're starting to see people think differently and do differently. And they're saying, you know what? We got to get beyond our four walls and understand that we're all in this together. And thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Sandlin. You know, so pun intended, I think you asked for a call to action. And that call to action needs to be everyone's a part of the community. And we need to look through that lens, think about participation. And then I really love the connection and thinking about connections isn't just human connections. It's also the connection to a book to take a journey and mm -hmm. actually explore your world, which I think is a good segue for our author panelists in, 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 involved right now, Tammy. So my next question is for you. Your book, All Because You Matter, does a really beautiful job of delving into real world topics that can sometimes be overwhelming. It also drives home the core message to readers that their story matters and other people's stories matter. Repeating that. Their stories matter and other people's stories matter, which embodies what World Read Aloud Day is all about. So question, when was the first time you felt that your story mattered? And why did you think that message is so important for young, diverse readers to hear? Okay, very layered question, I love it. <laughs> so the first time that I felt my story mattered, um, I was an adult. It was when I became a teacher. Now, for me to explain that, I have to dial back a little bit. When I was a kid growing up in Newark, New Jersey, I always loved books. I loved reading them. I even would write my own stories, but I never 
dreamed that I could become an author. It just, it just was never like presented to me as an option. And I think it had a lot to do with the types of books that were given to me in the library in stores, it, the types of books that were on the shelves and that I had access to. Whenever I do school visits, I talk about this a lot. And I, I even give a little bit of data. Uh, the CCBC, that's the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. They do amazing, excellent work uh, where they collect this data on children's books. Well, in 1986, when I was six years old and clearly a book lover, um, only 0.06% of the books that were published that year, that's out of 3000 books, that tiny percentage were books written by people of color, mm. black people, people mm. like me. Um, so at six years old, how could I think that I could become an author when this tiny, tiny percent of stories were being told? So fast forward to me becoming a teacher Growing up loving books, but not really being exposed to diverse children's books. When I became a teacher, I started reading books with my students. I was a fifth grade teacher and I discovered that, you know, there were authors like Kwame Alexander and Jacqueline Woodson, Meg Medina. I'm like, whoa, where were these stories when I was growing up? So I truly did not think that my stories mattered until I became a teacher, until I was a whole adult. And I was reading these stories with my students and we started writing stories together and we would read our stories aloud and I would read my stories to my students. And it was them who kind of gave me the green light, like, Miss Charles, <laughs> you should become an author. I wish I would have known that as a child. Maybe I would have started this this whole career way earlier. Um, but I think I think that there's something really important in that story. Today, we have a chance to make an impact. We can, we can change the narrative and we have been moving the needle. It's no longer 0.06%. I think it's something like 11%. That's still not enough, but. <laughs> We're going to keep, we're going to keep trying, keep pushing. Um, kids need to know, kids of color, especially, they need to know that they matter. They need to see themselves reflected on screen, on covers of books, in the pages of books, and not just these stories of pain, like yeah. stories, these wide range of stories that show the diversity within our diversity. All of that's important. It's important for kids of color to know that they matter, to know that their dreams matter, but it's also important for other children who aren't of color to see, oh, my friends can do and achieve exactly what I can. And that there's an even you know playing field here. It's important for everyone. I appreciate uh, your response. It was uh, very colorful and uh, insightful. Um, so a couple of things just to quickly point out uh, the fact that you picked up as an adult. Um, I totally understand that. Same thing with me. But the great thing that you're talking about is you're planting seeds so that we can become better as we move through yeah. generations. Um, I, I have to uh, plug. Well, one before the plug, the 0.06 percent um, is always astounding to hear that number. And I remember that feeling of not seeing diverse mm -hmm. titles. I'm so happy that we're in a better place. Yeah. And then completely not connected, but connected. But I have to say that um, my first um, read in that way was not only the same older as you, but uh, it was in Newark, just like you. Oh yeah, <laughs> okay. I had to share cool. that with you. All right, so on to the next one. The challenge gets harder. Who's up next? Let's see. We all know that representation, diversity, and giving children the opportunity to feel in the stories they read, that the stories they read are important. Dr. Sandlin, I imagine that it is also important for children to see the importance of education role modeled for them within their community. How important is bringing mentors into schools, which is something we talk about a lot, to showcase reading through read alouds and where <coughs> mentorship can be found in communities outside of school? Let me add to that. 
what are tools that educators can use to help model this behavior for parents so they have early involvement, which is key? Thank you for that question. I think that is one that we all should ponder on. I'll tell you one thing I have shifted from role models to real models. And when we look at real models, we find them all around. It is incredibly important that we are recognizing that we are storytellers and we all have a story. And part of that narrative needs to come through real models that are allowed to share with scholars. Um, and I call them scholars on purpose, not just students, because we're pouring life into them and we're sharing stories. And by having these real models come, by the way, these, this is a great opportunity to get parents involved to share their story. Often when you hear parent involvement, we, we kind of correlate that to filing papers, uh, making calls, um, doing some tedious work, rather than allowing them to share their stories of success. Just like what was said, instead of always um, hearing stories of pain, um, we'd love to hear stories of progress. Um, stories of success. And that can be from anyone. In fact, it should start with our scholars, yes. uh, you know, finding ways to elevate their voices and allowing them to share. They are real models as well. And I think would also change the empowerment pendulum if we allow them to do that. I love that response. You know, I agree with everything that you said. We have these conversations all the time. I love your phrase because, you know, when we finish uh, conversations like this, you think of things that stick. And usually the things that stick have this, uh, you know, just it's this aha, this idea phrase, or it's a story. Hmm. So I love the role models to real models because that means something to all of us. And I want to connect what, Tammy, you were talking about to, to Dr. Sandlin, what you just mentioned, which is sharing stories that can be success, happy, pain. It's about the whole emotional cipher circle 360 degrees of being humans very important for us very important for us so now i want to go back to our founder of world read aloud day pam we know reading is so important for our kids lifelong success how can we best convey a model of this for them in a way that feels genuine and authentic what is one thing we can all do to make a difference in our kids literate lives as at school home and within our communities well, I'm going to pay a huge tribute because this is our day to do it to the read aloud itself, the magical, massive power of reading aloud in our classrooms, in our homes, and to feel that we belong in that space, whether we're reading aloud in our language, uh, in our in in a in a story that we wrote ourselves, um, in a story that our child wrote, um, in stories that have been published by amazing people and um, and Tammy's book being an incredible example of that, that reading a book not just once, but more than once, rereading it, revisiting it, is a powerful, powerful way to say that everybody belongs to the reading community. And the other thing about the read aloud is it's a way to marinate our kids in beautiful, rich literary language, whether we're reading a poem, a picture book, a chapter book, a, a novel or a, a nonfiction informational text. Um, I remember my father reading aloud to me from the sports pages um, when we read newspaper by paper and um, he loved reading sports and he loved sharing that with me and his voice to this day is still in my, in my mind and in my heart. I dedicate this holiday to him for that reason. I think that the, the other thing is just about the read aloud is how powerfully, powerfully inclusive it is, that, that everyone belongs to it, that a child can read to an elder, an elder can read to a child, people can read across cultures and across space, um, as we said earlier, whether uh, virtual or in person. And there's just something about that experience that we've seen over these last decade of World Read Aloud Day, that it, it becomes something so, so deep and so connecting that people say, you know what, reading is something I think I do wanna try. We have older teenagers who've never felt a part of the world of reading, who've said to me, reading has never felt good for me. And so for me, I think that for the question you're asking, Dwayne, that is such a, an important question, which is what is one thing we can all do is to create a read aloud culture in our classrooms because and in our homes, because even if we ourselves don't feel like the best read alouders, our kids are incredibly accepting. And also for them to practice, too, is we can be incredibly accepting. But the read aloud is a way to 
really make reading visible and to also make a community in which everybody belongs. I, I love that term again, making reading visible. And another thing that you mentioned and, and just you know following you and listening to you and hearing you tell the story about reading newspapers with your grandfather, it, it shows that these moments that we have as teachers and adults are often the things that children who grow up to be the new adults remember. And it's actually becoming a part of their character or what drives their character. So thank you again for that share. And to take us home, Tammy from Newark. <laughs> Maybe not from Newark. I just had to say that. No, I was born there. I went to school okay. there. there. I graduated you go. There you go. high school from Newark. Yeah. There you go. So I think Newark's <laughs> a big shout out. By the way, shout out to everybody across the country. We love you all. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Tammy, I know you recently released a young adult book, Muted which yes. was about a group of teenage girls and was written in verse. So often when we discuss children's literacy and read, reading aloud, we are talking about a target audience that is usually much younger. But we know there are stories to be told at any age. What do you have to say to young adults with a story to tell? And what are ways that you think we as adults can effectively encourage them to share their stories inside or outside of the classroom? And then after Tammy speaks, Pam and Dr. Sandlin, if you guys have a thought, Please add in. So I I agree with you. I think the older children get, like especially once they reach their teen years, uh, it becomes like kind of scary to get your feelings out and 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 read aloud. Like my son is twelve, and he's he's already telling me, "Oh, mom, you don't have to read to me. I'm too old for this." No, you're gonna read aloud. We, <laughs> we, this is what we do, but. Um, for young adults with a story to tell, yes, it can be scary, but there's a quote, I don't know who said it, so maybe someone can comment with that. I think the quote is something like, uh, feel the fear, do it anyway. Mm. I remember when I was teaching, I taught 14, 14 years, um, and I mostly taught fifth grade in Linden, New Jersey. And so these were like the, the uh, senior kids of the elementary school. And they, they were approaching that young adult uh, age. When I was a teacher, there were a few methods that I incorporated in the classroom that, that sort of gave them a safe space to, to tell their story, even if it wasn't allowed um, in front of an audience. Uh, we had this exchange. So I did, uh, I had a chat box Mm -hmm. And in this chat box, students could write whatever was on their mind, whatever story they had to tell. They, they could write it, fold it up, put it in the chat box. It was a, lo it was a locked box. And, and that was our way of, you know, communicating. Maybe they didn't want to tell everybody their business, but I had that special moment with certain students. Another you know, another method that I incorporated in the class, and there was this one really, really hit home, um, is I had private journals mm. with my students. Um, and with these journals, again, I had drawers in my room that I would keep their journals in and I would lock them because again, this was a safe space. I wanted them to know that their stories matter and whatever is on their mind matters. Um, there was one student in particular who I won't name, but I'm still very much connected to her today because she's an adult. But in fifth grade, she was very much struggling with her identity. Mm -hmm. um, she she couldn't put it to words as an adult. I, I knew, but it wasn't anything. It wasn't like I wanted to thrust this label on her, but I did want to give her a place to get her feelings out. Mm -hmm. um, so moments like that really give students a voice even if it may not be on a soapbox or some platform for everyone to see, it's important to give kids a space, these teenagers especially, a space where they feel uh, that they're cared for, that they're listened to, and they, they can really get their thoughts out. So those are just two things that worked for me in my classroom, a chat box and a private journal, no grades. Right. You know, I didn't care about grades. I didn't care about spelling or grammar. Just get, just get the words on the paper. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I love what you, you said, and I'm going to pass it to Dr. Sandlin and, and, and Pam, but I just wanted to echo uh, the voice and agency that you spoke of is an important part um, in making sure that you pass that on to our older readers 
And uh, you talked about how you incorporated that in teaching and how that's also mm -hmm. something that we should empower parents and communities to know that that matters as well. But then um, you reminded me, because when you think about what you said, um, it connects to being an adult. We had a, a leadership meeting and one part of the conversation was a share about the five second rule and being able to actually have um, the strength and the agency to say something when something matters to you and know that you matter enough to actually share it. And so the things that you're teaching children in middle school is the same thing that you need to be an effective leader as an adult. And actually just to make sure you're taking care of your own personal SEL, like our amazing teachers out there. Um, but Dr. Sandlin and Pam, when you think about our older readers and making sure that we're influencing and empowering them and trying to persuade them to be a part of this movement of reading aloud and being okay to share their opinion, what are your thoughts? Well, I just want to, first of all, thank Pam for World Read Aloud Day. It is such a huge, wonderful, I'm sitting here reflecting, thinking about my own reading when I was younger. Um, I always read aloud to hear myself. And I truly believe it has a lot to do with my speaking now. I never knew I was going to be a speaker later. I, I had no idea I was going to be an author later. But the fact that my mother let me and my dad let me pick any book I wanted to at the library, which was what the rule was, you know, like no grades is a rule. I went to pick any book that just reading aloud, hearing myself, that is such an important thing. It's almost like you have to give children a license to be able to do it. And we really need to start pushing that more. You know, we 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 went on the other end where we've talked about, you know, what it was it read quietly or something in your head. We don't know what you're doing when you're, <laughs> but reading aloud does something to the space. It does something to your physical space, and it and it elevates you and lets you hear yourself. That is so and so important for a young person. I cannot. I mean, I'm getting chills thinking about how important it is to read aloud to because at some point you're introducing yourself to yourself. Ooh. <laughs> Say that again, Dr. Sandler. Somebody's preaching. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to go to church. <laughs> but you know, this is a ministry. What we're doing is a ministry. People don't know it. Ministry just means to serve and we're serving youth and families and we're, we're serving humanity all day long. But when I read to myself, I began to introduce myself to myself. And I realized that I had a voice. And sometimes the only time you're going to know that and find that out is when you read aloud. Because now your voice is permeating a space that was quiet. And you've given yourself an opportunity to pierce that silence with your voice. And let me tell you, that is the most powerful thing a young person can do because that affects their entire self-esteem. And as we talk about social emotional learning and student agency and individual contribution, that is where we start. That is a great place to begin. So I, I'm sharing that now that, so that everyone listening can understand this is not just a day. Yes. This is a movement. Yes. A movement. It is a part of what we should be doing all the time. And we should be listening and hearing everybody. By the way, parents, this is for you to do. This is for teachers to do. And guess what? Don't get on how do I say it. Just read. And, you know, most of our children are kinesthetic visual learners anyway, as was said, right? Letting them act it out. Let me tell you, you'll change your classroom. <laughs> You're talking about classroom management. They will manage you. <laughs> they will manage the room. They'll say, let's do this because now I have a character. I can be something and I can express myself, which is very much what we're talking about. So, and this, by the way, has a lot to deal with building community, right? You allow everyone to do this in a class that changes and builds community in a way that is so far different than trying to force it any other kind of way. That's a very authentic way um, of building community. 
So I'm sorry I talked so long, but I actually got excited about what I was saying. <laughs> you brought back some good memories. Uh, yeah. I, I, I used to do that Judy with Bloom. my students. Yeah. I love Judy Bloom. I don't know if anybody loved Judy Bloom. I love the Hardy Boys. I, you know, all of those books. I mean, I just really I keep on my you see, I'm behind me. Mm -hmm. You know, this is my library. I'm in the library now. So it's it's about keeping and holding on to those books forever. So thank so you. So let me ask everyone. Sorry about that, Dr. Sandler. No, sure. Let me ask everyone in our audience, if you are um, feeling the conversation related to what you do or what your goals are, and you have the time, either in the chat or in your own social media, that's a powerful statement. Introduce myself to myself with the hashtag of World Read Aloud Day. Show us that you're out there. Introduce myself to myself, hashtag World Read Aloud Day. And so the last person I want to speak on this particular conversation about getting people involved in that, um, Pam, what are your thoughts? Wow. Well, first of all, I just thank you, everybody on this panel and, and everybody watching it. But I just love what you all have been saying. It's uh, it's just means a lot um, to me just to listen and think about all the different layers. I mean, both about agency, about community, um, about being yourself, really being yourself. That's so beautiful. And I think that external reading voice helps us to practice being ourselves so that when we go and create our own internal voice, just as Tammy so beautifully described earlier, you know, finding that you have something to say, that's amazing. And I think World Read Aloud Day is so much about that, that there are all these voices in the world that are behind our students, our children saying, you can do this. You, every one of those amazing books that Scholastic publishes are books written by real people who actually have a story that they're sharing. That is such a powerful message for our kids that we can tell on World Read Aloud Day. And I guess I'll just say, as far as, you know, thinking about a, a message or thinking about this idea of, of the hopefulness of World Read Aloud Day is I think about a book I used to read aloud to my students many years ago called I'm in Charge of Celebrations by the author Bird Baylor. Mm. And that book was just had such an impact on me because it's about a little girl um, with, you know, alone in, in, in a space where she's um, in a desert. And she's saying, how can I create celebration in this space? And I think that's what I wanted for World Read Aloud Day. I, I did not think of the idea. It was a seven-year-old in a class I was reading aloud to. And at the end of the class, we had such a wonderful time reading aloud together. At the very end, he came up to me and said, Mrs. Allen, I wish we could do this all the time in school. And I, and he, I said, well, we should and we can. And he said, but I think we have to do a lot of other things that aren't as fun. And I said, you know what I think sometimes is that, yeah, he said that. I said, I think sometimes it's that we have to make sure people know that the read aloud is really good for you. Like it's really good to be read to. It's really good to practice it yourself. And he said, when it's my birthday, people give me a party and they they really pay attention to me. He said, we should do that for the read aloud. And <laughs> I went home and I said, that is a great idea. He's making his own celebration. And so we that's how World Read Aloud Day started. And I yes, yes. And I think that's true for our teenagers, for for all kids who may not have yet stepped into the world of seeing themselves not only as a reader, but as someone with a voice, someone with a story to tell of their own is to say, let's put them in charge of celebration. You know, how can we do this work together that literacy should be the grandest celebration there is, but our, our students have the best ideas. Yeah. Totally agree, totally agree. Beautiful words from all of you. Really appreciate everything you're saying, but we're not done yet because it's important for us to hear from our audience out there. And if you have some additional questions, feel free to start um, sharing them with us in the chat, but I'm, I'm gonna share some of the questions that have come through for a few minutes before we go to our closing uh, phase. One of the questions was, what books have made the biggest Im impact on you personally? And what is your favorite book? And I know Dr. Samlin and Pam, you guys shared in the chat, but why don't you guys share? And I'm going to, Tammy, buy you a little bit of time by having the two of them start since they already actually shared uh, inside. Why don't you start, Dr. Samlin? Oh, gosh. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. Oh, my favorite one is right here. If I could just grab it. Here we go. See? Not far. See, I have the real, true, true. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't oh think You remember this? Oh, that's a great addition. I Nancy love drew her entire wow. collection. I have the entire collection and the quest of the missing map. 
So I used to love um, and still do um, books that take me on a journey and um, are mysterious. And so this was so great. My my parents got me the entire collection and I, and to this day, and I will not tell you my age now, but just know I've kept them a long time. <laughs> and um, just as, as Pam said, reading and rereading them is just wonderful because you find something in there you haven't read before, even all this time. So, um, and by the way, I'm back reading the entire uh, and then uh, the entire series again. So it's exciting. That is great. That is great. And the fact you were able to come on, Doc Sandlin, you get an A plus for pulling it straight. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> that one was easy. They're all right here. <laughs> Tammy, don't sweat. You have time because we're going to Tammy. I'm first. ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Always oh ready. Right? Okay. Well, I couldn't, I can't pick just one, but I will say I have yeah. a few. One is um, that I've been obsessed with for the last few years because it's an amazing read aloud for any age. So anybody listening who just is looking and really needs something that may transcend ages, The Rooster Who Would Not Be Quiet um, by Carmen Agraditi and illustrated by Eugene Yelchin. These are two of our most accomplished children's book um, illustrators, authors really out there working today. And I love there's translanguaging in this book. There's just so much value and respect for that, which I love. And the, what's great about this story that Carmen writes is that it has it's really good for a read aloud because it's funny. There's you can make do voices. The rooster is hilarious. You could do lots of sound effects. It's really good. Great for acting out. The kids love to do that. But it's also really has a big message about like society and rules and like when is it not a good idea to have people quiet? When is it like really actually helpful and there's a lot of funny parts of this but it's a fable that older kids can actually really get behind and say how do i have my personal freedom in community and yeah. and vice versa how do i have my own autonomy so there's that um and also i'm not just saying this because this amazing author is here but i do love reading aloud all because you matter i think it has oh. the most incredible rhythm it's a inc very important mm. book and it's really i am i was so screaming when it was selected as this year's rad pick because it, it's a book I read over and over and over again. I've given it a million times over to everybody with babies and grandbabies, but also just it's a great book to read aloud. It just has a really good rhythm mm. to it. So thank you. Thank you for that. And then I do love uh, Jackie Woodson for older kids is a really she her books just read really well aloud. Brown Girl mm. Dreaming. Um, and then um, finally, I didn't put it in that chat there, but um, I, uh, oh, I did put Peter Reynolds. He's also a tried and true. You love so many books. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and then finally, I'll just give a shout out because maybe this is the book that completely, totally changed my life as a teacher hmm. is um, a book called The Dream Keeper by Langston Hughes. It's a collection of his poetry. My first year of teaching in a school for the deaf in Brooklyn, where um, everything in sign language and... Um, what we meant by aloud was really in, in that linguistic form. And the kids loved that book. They asked for it every day. Nobody ever got tired of it. It's a beautiful, also a beautiful book to perform and read aloud and really easy to memorize those poems too. So anyway, those are my, those are my picks. So Pam, because, uh, because you and the seven year old are the founders and creators of World Read Aloud Day, we're gonna let you get away with five or six titles. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I wrote them down. I took notes. I'm like, ooh, I gotta go shopping. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. One, one quick share, then I'm passing it to Tammy. And I may butcher the title, but you, I think you guys will be familiar. There's a book that I used when I was teaching in middle school, and we used it for like, you know, teaching satire and teaching like elements of uh, writing. And it was uh, the story of, uh, I think it was, it's the, the real story from the real bad wolf's perspective. And it had yeah, so that's, much, that's, it yeah. was so good. Oh, yes, that's so great. Middle schoolers no, 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 no. laugh at it because it's just hilarious. It's, it it's is. So funny, like, their childhood story, and all of a sudden, you get to hear the wolf's perspective. Of what yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's so great. I love that, too. Perspective is key. That's another great reason for reading, you know? Just, right. Mm -hmm. So, Tammy, our reading ambassador. <laughs> Drum My roll, face please. hurts from smiling so much. <laughs> Pam. <laughs> it's Pam's fault. It's her fault. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. Of course. <laughs> oh, today is Langston Hughes' birthday. Wow. Oh, perfect. perfect. Celebrate it. <laughs> okay, Tammy, what's your favorite book? Uh, okay, so <laughs> going back to my years in the classroom, like I said, I started reading these beautiful, diverse books from authors that I would have loved to read as a kid. And I'm also a little bit of a history geek. I, I love little known stories of ordinary people who have done extraordinary things. And this particular book, when I tell you I cannot write a picture book without reading this one first, I read it aloud. I must have read this book aloud a hundred times already because like I said, I, I can't write without reading. Drum Dream Girl by Margarita Engel mm. and Rafael Lopez is the illustrator. Beautiful art, beautiful poetry. Ugh, Margarita's like the goat. She knows I love her so much. <laughs> <laughs> she she actually uh, blurbed Muted as well because she's oh, wow. such a masterful poet. Yeah. But uh, this is the story of a an African Cuban Chinese girl in Cuba who wanted to play the drums as a little girl. Mm -hmm. But during this period in Cuba, if you were a girl, you could not play drums. Yeah. But she she was you know. She, she was fearful, but she had a dream and she did it anyway. So I love stories like that because every time I read it, I don't know, it just does something. I feel taller. <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm, there you go. Out my shoulders a little yours. bit more. I, I just, I love this book. Everything about this book, it's the kickoff to anything that I ever, ever write. That is amazing. Another amazing share. Amazing books. If you guys are sharing books that you read for our, all of our audience that you think capture the same spirit or anything that you think is a great book, please share it in the chat. I'm sure people want to see what books people like. I'm going to move on to the second question from our from our audience. Um, this one is uh, coming from Facebook. It's um, from one of our audience uh, that's visiting us from Facebook. I always read aloud with my students in grades nine through 12. I think this is a great question. And mm -hmm. even in my college classes, but I did the reading. What is your feeling about who should be the reader? Mm -hmm. Who wants that one? Feel free to jump in. Well, I'll, I'll jump into that one. Um, I think I'm very happy that the this uh, listener, watcher, uh, is reading to her students of all ages. I think that's really important. I think it never, um, it never goes away how impactful it is, both in terms of the sensation of belonging and creating that community, but also um, as uh, you know, we've been threading through this conversation that it actually does build skills, that you actually are immersing yourself in text and language, vocabulary, all kinds of amazing things are happening. And so there's that. I do think though that um, it is in a safe space, it's a wonderful thing to have our young people reading aloud themselves, um, not in a judging, not in a way in which we're making them uncomfortable, but in a way where we create that safe space for them to practice their fluency. Um, fluency, that idea of you know, skill, of speed, of, of, of expression, it, it's a wonderful thing to do and also helps um, our young people build their skills. So all the way through, really, because even through high school and through university, um, our students are doing the work of becoming readers. So I'd say make that a, a interactive, that you're doing both. You, you are giving space um, for yourself to be the person who's reading aloud, immersing them in all kinds of historic text and new text, fresh text that, that will be meaningful and interesting to them that might be beyond them in their, at their independent level. Um, and also that, that we give our students a chance to practice in a safe way to feel like they practice their fluency and expression within the community. So both. Makes total sense. Any any ads? Yeah, I, I just want to just add to that piece just a bit because I agree everything that was said. Um, I, I just want to, reading aloud is, is you have to create a safe space, but we have to remember also it's, it's a brave space mm -hmm. um, because when you, to read aloud takes courage. And um, part of our work is to create this safe and brave space by modeling reading aloud, but also creating groups to read together and a variety of different ways than just say you read in front of everybody. 
because some are not comfortable with that yet. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to create those brave moments so that they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is can be done in a variety of different ways. Um, I would say mix up how you do it. Um, don't just be silent yourself because you are a model for good reading as well. But um, praise is very important when children read aloud too. Giving mm -hmm. them praise that they read, that they spoke well, that they used great diction, that they were able to bring that voice alive. Being really specific in your feedback really makes children want to read aloud even more. Love it. Love it. I have another It doesn't question. matter what age they are, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, so I'm not just talking little, you know, all of them, K-12, need that feedback, and they also need that praise. Agree. And I think this next question ties to your responses because, Dr. Sandlin, you just went into the space of environment mm -hmm. and really pulling yourself out of the academic goal and into really that space of SEL. Um, so this question is similar, different, but similar maybe in that space, but I'll leave it up to you guys in relation to how you respond. How do you make reading exciting for a six-year-old? What about what about if your child is resistant or defensive when asked to read? What strategies would you recommend for that scenario? So I can I can hop in on this one because well, he's not six anymore. The little boy on the cover back there, he was eight <laughs> when when I wrote this book. Um, and he did kind of have these moments where he would be hesitant to read. I think we just have to make kids feel comfortable. And the way that I would do it as a as his mom, but also as a former teacher, I I made sure that I read aloud to him and that I showed him that I too make mistakes when reading. Mm -hmm. I might skip a word, I might mispronounce a word, and you better believe his six-year-old self really got a kick out of pointing out my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and something about that just kind of gave him license to, okay, it's my turn, I'll read now. Oh, mommy made a mistake? Okay, it's okay if I make a mistake when I read this passage on the page, so I'm going to just read too. So, but my mistakes weren't, it wasn't forced. You know, I, I made real mistakes. I'm an adult. I, I still skip words sometimes. I don't mm -hmm. read perfectly. So I think it's just important to do it authentically. Show, show children that, you know, you can read, you can make mistakes, but hop right back in. And one thing that my son really loved, he loved acting out whatever we were reading. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, when you were talking about that earlier and I was like, yes, that brought back a lot of memories for me, just, uh, you know, raising him to be a reader and, and acting it out. But this is what he really loved. He loved reading books that had movie tie-ins or something that's on Netflix. And it gave, it gave him something to look forward to. Oh, we're going to read this book. And when we're done with this book, we're going to bake all the snacks, <laughs> at, you know, brownies, everything. We're going to lay out all the snacks and now we're going to watch the movie. And my my little dorky self, I had the Venn diagram going. I'm like, oh, <laughs> let's compare the book to the movie. How are they alike? How is it different? Like he enjoyed all of that. Nice. So, I mean, that's just some some ways that hopefully you can get your six-year-old excited about reading. I'm sure that you guys have like other suggestions, but as a parent, uh, those suggestions worked for me in my home. I, I love your suggestion. Oh, I'm Go sorry. Down. I just wanted that relevant reading. When the stories are relevant to them, it yeah. makes a huge difference, particularly in high school. Back to the person who said that in the chat. You know, making you know stories that are relevant to what they know and their age and their era, I think is is very very important um, because then it becomes interesting and. Um, it makes a further connection than something that's so far away and, and off. Excellent. You guys, I'm, I'm only for the sake of time, we're going to ask one last question and then we're going to start sharing some information that'll help you continue this journey as we close out shortly. But I want to get to this one last question. I think this is a great question. Mm. Um, and I'm curious, anyone who has a, a response for this one, any book suggestions for young children Specifically, they're thinking of a four-year-old, but I think it could be any age. 
um, that have, but let's make sure we answer for a four-year-old, um, that have just started to notice different ethnicities and skin colors. Mm. What book would you recommend when someone uh, is aware and becomes curious that we have diverse types of people in the world? Is there a book that you would recommend? Here's something good to like, you know, continue that journey. That's a difficult one. Okay. So that, I think I'll answer the first part of that question. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, you know, like, what would you say? I guess it's what would you say to a child who's around four years old? Not what would they say, although that might be a good extension. They wanted to know what book. Oh, what and, book? Yes. What book would you recommend so they could use it as a tool to continue this exploration now that you see the world in a diverse setting. Oh, and, well, and the reason I say it's difficult. Your book. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. See, I wasn't thinking that. See, I was. I was. I pulled pull this one right back up. Oh. <laughs> Raphael does such a beautiful job of showing all of the beautiful skin mm -hmm. tones of people oh, in that's Cuba. Great too. You and know? can you hold up next to that book, your book? Oh, that yeah. would be yes. I mean, you know, if you were sick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And when I wrote this book, All Because You Matter, the words came to me in a dream and the art was in my dream. And I knew right away that the art was Brian Collier because I'm a fan. And one of my favorite, in addition to Drum Dream Girl, another book that I cannot write a picture book without reading first is, um, well, really anything, <laughs> trombone, shorty, like he's done so much. But I, I, I literally pick up all of his books, but Dave the Potter is my favorite. Yes. The oh. thing about Brian's work is that he does such a, an amazing job with skin color. Like he shows such a broad range of all of the beautiful, we really are as humans, just a rainbow, <laughs> you know, if you think about it, we come in all, all kinds of shades and colors. And I think Brian does a great job with that. So if I had to pick a book suggestion, I'm going to say Google Brian Collier, look at his whole repertoire because yes. he does a fabulous job of showing humanity on the page, his colors, everything is just stunning. And I think these are great, uh, conversation starters to have with your children. I mean, at four years old, that's wonderful. It yes, is this is the time to start pointing out. If your child is pointing this out, praise that, uplift that, find books that support that curiosity, but don't forget to drive home the point of the beauty of the, the different skin tones. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, yeah. Because if we were all the same, well, wouldn't that be boring? Yes. <laughs> this is how we were made. We were made like this. Everyone is different and everyone is special. That's why, you know, we, we are all, you know, humans and it's beautiful. So yeah, Brian Collier, just, just look him up. He's genius. And I I'll want give a shout out to, yes. oh, sorry. I'll give a shout out also to Andrea Pinckney, who oh, um, yes. had, her books are awesome. And she has this really amazing series of board books. I'm thinking about the four-year-old because for them, oh, you know, yes. you want them to carry the books around. And um, this one, uh, Bright Brown Baby, is amazing. I also really love, um, there's a, a new book that just came out last year um, called We All Play by Julie Flett. Um, and it's Ooh. a story of an, a, an indigenous, a, a, a young indigenous child um, and her life, um, thinking about play as being really important to her. And, and two, just this sort of celebration of, the way people live, how they're living, the beauty of that, what, what Tammy's saying, you know, it's a, it's a celebration. I mean, it's our humanity. It is, it's so amazing. And that's the, the sadness and the loss when books are not published that are representative of all people, because we all lose. The child loses, the family loses, the schools lose, everybody loses. So the fact that we're like, you we said right from the beginning, we're it's getting better, but we have a long way to go. We've got to advocate for this. And because, you know, that little child, that young child, you know, growing up in a new world, imagine, I mean, imagine it would be a whole different world for everybody. Um, 
if we could see how valuable, how precious. Um, so those are two of my favorites lately. And, so, and I appreciate that. I know we're one minute to the final. So I just want to make sure before we close, um, one, appreciate all of your feedback. Um, first, I want to say to the people who put questions in the chat, the ones we, we were able to get to, thanks for sharing. I, I really appreciate you guys sharing yourself and allowing us to respond to it. I do want to say that if you want to search for vast uh, books that deal with diversity, don't forget Scholastic.com, 100 years old, largest mm -hmm. children's publisher and all focused on diversity. And then lastly, I want us to, in the chat, if you guys could thank our wonderful panel i think you picked up on the fact that we could still continue this conversation <laughs> for another hour or two if we wanted to but if you guys wouldn't mind giving them a shout out in the chat just appreciating the advocacy that they're doing for communities across the country and so with that said um we've covered a lot today i'd love to hear from the audience please share in the chat as well any ways here's the question for the audience what ways will you engage readers at school at home or anywhere. Share something that comes that you think is an idea that you want to make sure that inspires you. How will you engage readers at school, at home, or anywhere? If you can share that with us in the chat, um, I think that's beautiful energy for us all. Thank you for joining our literacy panel, how to incorporate literacy anytime, anywhere. To keep the learning going, visit the World Read Aloud Day website and join us tomorrow on Story Voice for the live read alouds featuring scholastic authors. Happy World Read Aloud Day, everyone. <laughs>